In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So you may be about to see your rector get struck by lightning, uh, but I kind of wish that this passage was absent that verse, John 3.16. I feel like it gets too much seen as the preamble to how we get that famous verse 316, or people would say, oh yeah, uh, at church we had that 3, 6, John 316 reading today. Um, and we miss so much of the meat that's in the story. The part that doesn't feel that way is the part that reads John 316 differently because of where it falls in John's narrative. And John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, is what, uh, is what Luther described as the gospel within the gospel. It's what you see sometimes uh, in the stands at football games. Uh, you see it sometimes even in the eye block on athletes' uh, 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 eye block. Um, it is one of those passages that sits very closely uh, to people's hearts. And I think at times we've heard that first part of it. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then I think over time we've heard more of the second half of that. That those who believe, those who are firm in their faith, those who are convicted, there's some good news for you. But for the rest... And I don't think that's what God had in mind at all. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but what I want to focus on is how fascinated I am with Nicodemus. I mean, what was going on in that guy's head? He had everything to lose. He was a leader of the Pharisees. He wasn't just a leader. He was part of the inner council. He was part of the Sanhedrin. He was part of the people who saw what kind of danger Jesus Jesus meant for them, for their livelihood, for their faith, uh, for their security, their protection. And the more that he got, garnered attention, the more people that paid attention to this, uh, this rebel rouser, this rebel, the more Rome was going to pay attention, and he could put the whole thing in jeopardy. And while Nicodemus' friends are trying as hard as they can to quell this voice that seems to be undermining everything, Nicodemus, some reason, for some reason, goes to him. Why? And there's different ideas about why he goes uh, in the middle of the night, why he goes uh, at night. And uh, John is certainly playing, uh, as we get farther into the story, uh, with this idea of light and darkness. Um, but I believe he was going in the dark of night because he didn't want to be seen. Because he was doing something that he knew. Uh, if he had asked the Sanhedrin and, and the other leaders in the, in the church, hey, do you think it's a good idea for me to go and talk to Jesus? I just want to find out a little more what he's all about. Um, they would have said, absolutely not. Unless you're going to try to publicly trip him up. But that's not why he went. There was something deep inside Nicodemus uh, that was so convicted that there was truth in this man, that there was God in this man that it had to have been just gnawing on it, had to have been keeping him up. Something in him was willing to risk a whole lot to go find out, was there more truth in this man? And he wasn't there to be converted. He might have even just been there just to put it to rest. If I talk to him and I'm convinced that he isn't who people say he is, he isn't who I've seen glimpses of, then maybe I can go back home and go back to the life I have and everything will be okay. But I've got to get this thing that's just not up inside of me out. And so he goes. He goes in the dark of night and he sort of presses Jesus. He says, you know, you've done things that I've never seen anyone else do. You say things and you have worked miracles that there has got to be something of God in you and I want to know more. I've studied the law Tell me. This is a very, very Ben paraphrase. This is not exactly as it. This man is studied in the law. He knows the rules. He knows how to follow faithfully. He knows the things that he needs to keep himself clean. 
and he knows how to teach others about what can be learned and digested from right here. But Jesus said, it's not just about following the word of God. It's not just about following God. It's about participating in the divine life. It's about living with an openness to something beyond what you can know. About letting God in. Not just waters that wash away sin and keep you clean, but waters that give you new life. You need to be open to God moving and stirring in you something you can't control. You need to be converted, to be transformed, to believe in the love of God that gave you the law, that it can work and breathe in you and transform your life, and you can be a transforming agent for the world. It's going to be hard. It's going to have cost. Me? I'm going to get nailed to a cross. Just like Moses, when uh, his followers were dying from poisonous snake bites and they begged for mercy and God said, make an idol of, 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 a, of a serpent uh, out, of, out of bronze and put it on a pillar and have the people, when they look at that pillar, uh, they will be saved. It will be their antidote for the poisons of the snake. And he said, I will be lifted up on the cross, and that will be the antidote for all of the brokenness, all of the people who couldn't follow every letter of the law, all the things that this world can do. And it will transform the world. And you can be part of that. You can be part of that transformation. And then he had that John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Right after that image of Jesus hung on the cross like that serpent on the pillar, God so loved the world that he gave his only son to the end that all that believe in him might not perish but have an everlasting life. But there's something in that passage about the verb tense that's worth paying attention to. God so loved the world. It's not that God's done loving it. It's that it's an unconditional, already reality. It's in past tense. God loved the world. God made the world, looked upon it, said it was good. God loved the world enough to send his son into it. God loves the world so much now. But it is not a conditional. It is there. God gave his son, past tense. That Jesus was given for all of us for all time. But that's not conditional either. It has been done for us once and for all. But the part that isn't in past tense is the believe part. Because it really isn't a one-time thing. We're not saved because we signed on the dotted line. We signed a letter of agreement that says uh, we hold these things to be true. We try every Sunday to stand up and proclaim our faith. And sometimes it resonates with us and shakes us to our core. And other times uh, the words just seem to be on a piece of paper and we aren't sure whether we trust them or not. We wake up some days deeply convicted and some days we turn on the news and wonder where is God. But it's not a past tense verb. It's not a one time. It's a journeying word. We who walk in faith, opening ourselves to a light that's already all around us, a love that's already been shared uh, and continues to spill out a gift given for us just to be able to open and receive. That word is an action word that's continuing to take place every day of our lives. Uh, and whether we're in the cave uh, with our eyes closed and our ears covered, it is still right outside our door. And the beautiful part of the story is the journey of Nicodemus. So this is only the third chapter of John, and we have no idea what happens to him uh, uh, after this uh, for some time. He leaves. We don't know whether he heard enough to, to put this out of his mind, whether he heard enough uh, to fall at the feet of Jesus and be transformed. All we know is that he heard this message. And then he appears again. He appears again in that night that we will, uh, we will celebrate or we'll walk through on Thursday, that night where we, uh, we have that gift of the Lord's Supper, uh, that night um, where Jesus is arrested 
And as they're ready to hang him uh, on a cross, as they're ready to, uh, to be done with this as quickly as they can so that they can move on uh, to the security of knowing that Rome uh, is, 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 uh, is unfettered uh, and they can go back to being the church that they were and forget this Jesus thing ever happened, that's when Nicodemus speaks up. As part of the Sanhedrin, he says, you know what? Our law says that this man needs and deserves a fair trial. He should be, he should be tried fairly. A little, bit of, a little bit of rebellion, but he's still firmly within that, that the organization. He's firmly still um, uh, in that tradition, uh, but he does have the courage to speak up and to say, you know what? We can't do this. We have to do this the right way. And then it, it gets even more, more transformative. On the other side of that cross, that cross that we're walking towards, a beautiful thing happens. After Jesus dies, two men say, you know what? This beloved child of God should be treated like any beloved child of God. He should be buried with the grace and the dignity and the ritual that it should be afforded to every one of God's children. And he brings an excessive amount of ointment uh, uh, and, 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 uh, and herbs to prepare the body. And in that, we see his Easter moment, that moment where that truth is claimed those pieces that were already true from the beginning of time, uh, that he was beloved, that a gift was given. But he believed, and his Easter happened before the tomb was empty as he wrapped that beloved child, and he looked at that beloved child of God, and he saw God, and he knew that a gift had been given and that he was indeed loved, a love beyond anything. Because God so loved him that he gave his only begotten son, held in his very arms, to the promise that he who now believed would not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen.